It was a murder of a young mother that devastated her family. This young lady said, Dear, sorry to trouble you, Mr. Brown, you deserve better than this. We've just found your daughter's body. The appalling death of Claire Wood at the hands of her former partner brought the horrifying effects of domestic violence to the public consciousness. Two women a week are murdered by their ex-partners or their current partners. It's a shocking statistic, but for every single statistic, there's a devastated family. What happened to his daughter inspired a father's fight to protect victims of domestic abuse, a fight that would lead to the heart of government. I want to see an end to violence against women and girls. I want to see an end to domestic violence. It is an abhorrent crime. The senseless murder of Claire Wood was a crime that shook Britain. Salford in Greater Manchester was home to Claire Wood, a 36-year-old single mother who lived in the city with her young daughter. In April 2007, shortly after moving house, Claire began looking for a new relationship. She'd been on a number of internet dating sites, met George Appleton, struck up a relationship. And for a while, you know, that relationship seemed to be going well. Just under two years later, George Appleton would rape and murder her. My daughter was a strange character in her own way. Claire would be gushing with enthusiasm. She was going to take on the world. She would be able to do this, that. The next job was going to be the most brilliant. And uh, little or nothing come of that. She was clever. She could do this, that, and the next thing. And the minute she seemed to be succeeding, she stopped. But uh, when she was upbeat, she really was, she was a gregarious, fun-loving young lady. She was all I could ask for in a daughter. I met George Appleton in my house in Batley. My daughter had come up from Salford to visit me, and George had driven him up. I've met many people over my, my career. I've worked with some real rogues in the prison service. But this laddie came into my room, and I took an instant dislike. You all right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're relaxing. There was an aura about this lad that I just didn't take to at all. And when I look back, I often wonder if it was my prejudice or whatever, but no, I, I felt as though he was case in my house. When they had gone, I, I phoned my daughter and said, would you do me a favor? Uh, I am taking this laddie at all. Don't bring him back. Claire met George Appleton on Facebook uh, and the danger, I guess, with any uh, online social media site online dating sites is that this person is just presenting themselves to you on paper on screen and and there's no way of knowing about this person until you meet them and sort of find out a bit more about them and and that was the situation with claire really you know she was looking for somebody she was looking for a partner you know and that's the way that people do things now you know that that it's all online This was the latest love of her life. Uh, she was going to get married to this lad. And I, uh, I told her in no uncertain terms, I said, uh, if, if that does come about, I said, uh, it really will put a, a strain on our relationship. I says, I beg you not to. In an effort to placate her father, Claire opened up to him, revealing what she thought was the truth about George Appleton's past. Claire had volunteered the information to me. She says, I, I know he's not perfect, Dad. I know he's done time. She says, but it was only for mortar and offences. <laughs> I, I was a prison officer at the time, and click, click, click. You don't do time for mortar and offences. 
unless it's really serious. So I, I looked at that one somewhat with a jaundiced eye, but didn't delve any further because I was frightened at opening up a can of worms that uh, once I'd taken the lid off, I, c I couldn't have put anything back. I should have said my piece there and then and to hell with the consequences, but that wasn't the case. Tellingly, Michael's instincts about his daughter's new boyfriend were right. George Appleton was certainly no petty criminal, and Claire was tragically unaware of his violent past. George Appleton had a string of offences against him. He was done for several harassment cases of women. He was done for kidnap um, at knife point. He was an extremely violent man who used domestic abuse to perpetrate control over vulnerable female victims. In February 2004, almost three years before Appleton would meet Claire Wood, he began a relationship with Carol Agnew. I met George through a friend of mine, but at the time that I thought he was a good bloke, and my friend said, oh, he's a really nice bloke, we've met him a few times, you might like him, Carol. So I went, oh, because I was looking for someone at the time anyway. He had a gift of the gab at the beginning, and I just got on so well at the beginning, and then he, he just started dwindling, and then he just started seeing other things, you know, errors, lies, little things, you know, little traces of anger and things when uh, you wanted to go out shopping or do other things, you know, you wanted to be always at your side, wouldn't leave me alone. In a chilling echo of Carol's experience, within weeks of their relationship starting, Claire too began to grow concerned that Appleton was not all he seemed. Then the jealousy started kicking in, his refusal to accept that she wanted to go out and do other things as well and started questioning if she was who she was contacting on Facebook. She started to realise that, that this man wasn't who he said he was on paper and didn't turn out to be the kind-hearted, loving, uh, sort of funny um, guy that he was portraying himself to be. I think George looked at women that he needed a woman in his life. He needed to possess a woman and to have her. As soon as he met a woman, he just wanted her. You know, and he just put his stamp on her there and then, which I didn't realise till later on. Perpetrators come in all shapes and sizes. You know, they've not got it stamped on the head, I'm a perpetrator. And the, the thing is, they don't perpetrate the violence straight away, so it's not like you'd meet them in a coffee bar and then they start being horrendous to you. It's the slow drip, drip, drip. He had violent tempers, yeah. I think he, he just seen red. He just seen red at certain points, and when they seen red, he just went for it. But the tempers lasted for days and weeks with him. Uh, like, he had to get his own back on you no matter what. He put his hands on my throat once, but my son walked in, my son walked in, so he just backed off because I said to him, what are you doing? And he just said, oh, nothing, you know what I mean? He just made out his casual. Years later, Claire too began to grow worried about Appleton's behaviour. She had a daughter to think about as well. She did start to think, you know, I don't want to live my life like this anymore. Each day I feel worse. I have to consider my daughter also. And after all you've done, I can't have you back. It's not fair on her. And she knows I'd never be happy with you. From a diary entry, sort of hearing the emotion that she was putting across, it was a cry for help, really. I want you to be well. Good luck. I really mean it. I was ignorant of it all. But she, she was living 60 miles away, uh, seldom got her on the phone. And it, the, the thought then, it, it's all very well, me, me be possibly being hard on myself, but at that time I suspected nothing. If the victims tell the family and friends and then the, the mother and father's having a go when they're around there for Sunday dinner, she's going to cop for that when they've gone. And that's the other thing as well, you know, it's going to be like, why have you effing told them and you better not tell them again, so then you not, don't tell things because you know you're going to get yourself in more trouble. I was led to believe that he was making a nuisance of himself. That was Claire's words. And I would said to her, if that's the case, pack your bags, come up here and wait till the, 
wait till it dies over, it'll die a death, uh, whatever. She didn't have a job at the time, so she had, apart from her responsibility to her, her daughter, but she said, no, I, my family and friends are down there, and uh, I won't let George chase me out of where I am. Claire's refusal to bow to Appleton's threats and intimidation would have dreadful consequences less than three months later. He broke windows, he punched holes in doors or walls, he took the phone off the, off the wall and he attempted to rape my daughter. Claire Wood, a 36-year-old single mother from Greater Manchester, had started a relationship with a man called George Appleton, who she had met online. Tragically, she had no idea that he was in fact a serial domestic abuser who had a history of preying on women. When I broke up with George, I think he was devastated. He didn't like to be rejected. It must be just down to his insecurities or his childhood or something to do, you know, his background. When I used to go out to work, no matter where I was, he just used to follow me in the, in the car, but it was like three vehicles behind, or he used to park up two streets behind, and then he used to start following me again. It was day in and day out, but sometimes I didn't even see him in the car because he used to hide around the corners. He must have slept in his car some nights, waiting for me to come out. He was timing things all the time, or watching for the slot where he could take the post, or maybe try and find a way in the house. Only a few years later, Claire Wood found herself in the same dreadful position. She was completely unaware that the man she was sharing her life with was in fact a violent predator. It's not like victims seek out bad people. I think it's like perpetrators groom victims and it doesn't start, the violence does not start straight away. It's the slow tapping. You might get the, you know, the I've only done that because I'm jealous because I love you. What you start to think as well is that it must be my fault. I must be making him feel like that. You know, if he, he wasn't like that to start with. Maybe I annoy him. Maybe it's something I'm doing that's, that's making him like that. By October 2008, 18 months into their relationship, Claire had endured enough. And wanting a more secure life for her and her daughter, she wrote Appleton a letter saying she decided to end their relationship. There is no easy way to say this but I don't want to be with you. Too much has happened. I can't ever trust you, no matter what you do. My daughter had said, that's enough. There's the door. I don't want any more to do with you. I don't, you're a bad influence on my daughter. There's the door, don't come back. You still scare me, and I can't be with someone I'm frightened of. Leave me alone. That's all I ask. Don't contact me. That's the way it needs to be. I need to get on with my life. If you have any feeling for me, you'll let me do this. Appleton took the news of the breakup badly. Instead of walking away, his harassment of Claire actually got worse. People think once the perpetrators left the property, the women are safe, they're not. That's at the most dangerous time because there's lost the power and control over that person in the house. He couldn't cope with the rejection when, the, when I told him I wanted to finish with him. My daughter phoned me up and she said there's been an ambulance at the door asking, well, for Carol Agnew. She said that, she said there was a dead body. She said she was very confused by it because she said you must come to the wrong house or someone's given the wrong information. And they said, no, it was definitely a phone call saying that there was a deceased person in the house. And I, and, uh, I was traumatised, but I, I knew who it was from previous phone calls of what he said, of the phone calls and the messages saying that he wanted me dead. And he was going to throw acid in my face and numerous things he was going to do to me. George Appleton would go on to exhibit exactly the same violent behaviour when Claire Wood ended their relationship in October 2008. He started harassing Claire, turning up unannounced at a house, uh, knocking on a door in the early hours, threatening behaviour, threatening to hurt her. On the 7th of October, Claire went to Pendleton Police Station in Salford after George Appleton had threatened to burn her house down. In response, Appleton was arrested. He was put into custody and then um, 
he was like out of custody and uh, I know he got his bail varied, which still amazes me to this day that he was allowed to go and visit his friend who just lived a few doors down. You know, none of that was checked. Appleton was bailed by the police on condition he stayed away from Claire. He challenged the conditions, stating he had to visit friends nearby. And as a result, his bail conditions were altered. The police clearly underestimated how dangerous George Appleton was in terms of his bail conditions, in terms of the restrictions that were placed on him. It was a few months before Claire was murdered. She um, self-referred into our agency because we have a helpline and she was offered support and assistance from one of my outreach staff at the time. She disclosed that there'd been emotional violence, there'd been some sexual violence as well. The Salford Independent Domestic Abuse Support Service provides specialist help to victims of domestic abuse. As well as advice, they can also provide security equipment to help victims feel safe in their own home. My staff arranged for her to have sanctuary done, which is um, target hardening. You get like new locks, um, secure windows and stuff like that. So that was organised and also my staff arranged for the fire safety unit to go around and they'll put in smoke detectors, they'll take the letterboxes off in case people are putting um, petrol bombs through. Because we get that, we get a lot of arson. At the beginning of November, Claire contacted the police again but this time to ask for the charges against Appleton to be dropped. She claimed his attitude had improved. Victims will withdraw their um, statements and their allegations um, because, you know, if we're looking at it, it takes a long time to leave and the, the time it takes to get it into court and the time, like, they've come and done the statement off you, the perpetrator's got a way to worm the way back in or they'll tell you they're sorry, never do it again. And, you know, you want to believe it. And again, to keep the peace, you probably will say, all right, then, I'll drop the charges again if you promise you're not going to do it again to me. And a lot, of, a lot of victims do that. You could look at it and say, well, you can't blame the authorities because, you know, at the same time, Claire was kind of up and down in terms of, did she want to make, you know, press charges? Didn't she want to press charges? What Did she want to leave him or was she going to marry him but you can apply that situation to most domestic abuse situations sadly Claire's father had no idea of the awful trauma his daughter was going through and to find out that uh, my daughter had been interviewed by the police on uh, five five or six occasions that there had been a stopper put on her letterbox because he'd threatened to pour petrol and set the house on fire. If I had known, uh, I would have been down there in a, in a second. I really would. I'm not the tallest of fellas, and I've met bully boys all through my life, and bullying doesn't stop at the, the, the playground gates. It continues in life, and I recognised... Uh, that in George Appleton too late. But that's what George Appleton was. He was basically rotten. Despite still being on bail, Appleton seemingly continued to contact Claire, either in person or via social networks. On January the 18th, she told police that he had confronted her and sexually assaulted her. Due to insufficient evidence, the charges were dropped. And more importantly, Appleton's violent history went unnoticed. There's a safety net supposedly out for people in Claire's situation. But as has been proven, uh, all too often these girls just fall straight through it. Nobody knows. It's either kept indoors or when it was exposed that he was doing what he was doing to my daughter, not enough was done. Thank you. My daughter phoned the police to say he was making a nuisance of himself and 24 hours later another policeman turned up and he hadn't a clue she'd phoned the police. One police station couldn't talk to the other. One policeman couldn't talk to another. 
This desperate breakdown in communication affected not only the police, but also the other support services who had tried to help Claire. We wasn't told about all his previous, and he had previous, and he'd done the same to other partners as, he, as he'd done to Claire. If we would have had all the information, then maybe, you know, we would have done something, something different. Because when you read um, George Appleton's history, he's a very dangerous man and he's very dangerous t towards women. And we found out that he'd actually, you know, been on probation and he threatened to do similar to other people. And what he'd said he was going to do to other people, he finally did to Claire. In all, Claire Wood contacted police for help four times in as many months fearing for her life, saying Appleton was threatening to kill her. On February the 2nd, his threats turned into reality. I picked up the phone and I said, hello, it's Michael Brown, what can I help? Can I help you? And this young lady said, Dave, sorry to trouble you, Mr Brown, you deserve better than this. I'm Detective Constable, a, a Detective Sergeant, I can't remember her name. I really can't, you know, my mind went blank after that. Uh, you really need to, you deserve better than this. Uh, we've just found your daughter's body. Yeah. <laughs> On the night she died, George Appleton came round to Claire's house and he strangled her in her bed and set her body on fire. So, you know, you, to strangle somebody anyway, but then to set her on fire is just, you know, that, that in itself is the, the calling card of how evil a man George Appleton was. He had no regard for Claire. You know, her daughter luckily wasn't in the house. It was just horrendous to hear, you know, raped and she was hit over the head with some heavy objects and then to leave her an ashtray on top of her to pretend she'd been smoking in the sleep is just shocking. She had a panic alarm in and she didn't even have the chance to press that, you know, to get the police in the emergency, but it was horrendous what he did, horrendous. As Claire's family were left to mourn the loss of their daughter, attention turned to George Appleton. Where was the prime suspect in the murder? Claire Wood was murdered by her ex-partner in Salford in February 2009. The crime further highlighted the insidious nature of domestic violence and began to make people aware of just how widespread it is. More than one in four women in this country will suffer domestic abuse of some form over their lifetime. And last year, we saw 77 women killed by their partner or ex-partner. Now, that is a lower number than we've seen since 1998-99. But even one is too many. This is a real issue. It's one we need to deal with. Domestic violence is a, is a heinous crime. And I think very often it goes underreported. I don't think we truly know the scale and extent of domestic, domestic abuse. And I use that word domestic abuse rather than domestic violence because people live in abusive relationships where they're controlled financially, emotionally. You're very popular. What are you doing with my phone? You wearing that? You don't want to look cheap, do you? The definition of domestic abuse was recently extended to include 16 and 17 year olds and how frightening is that? That 16 and 17 year olds are now experiencing a relationship that is abusive. You're not going to make a fool of yourself tonight, are you? I love you too much to let you do that. Abuse in relationships isn't always physical. For information and help, search This Is Abuse. Two women a week are um, murdered by their ex-partners or their current partners. You know, two murders a week. It's a shocking statistic, but for every single statistic, um, there's a devastated family. Claire Wood had ended her relationship with George Appleton in October 2008 after she suspected him of having an affair. Rather than leave quietly, he began harassing her. Despite calling the police several times, her pleas for help went unheeded, allowing Appleton the chance to rape and murder her. 
before setting her body on fire. To know that a member of my family spent the last minutes on this earth kicking, screaming and fighting. <sighs> because some idiot couldn't take no for an answer. <sighs> Leaves me dumbfounded. It really does. My daughter was battered, raped, strangled, and set on fire, and I couldn't even, we never even had a chance to say cheerio. Immediately after killing Claire, Appleton went on the run, prompting a nationwide manhunt. George, if you're listening to this, can I urge you to get in touch as soon as possible? I need to speak with you. I am concerned about your welfare. If you don't feel confident contacting me, can I urge you to contact your solicitor? On the 12th of February, five days after Claire's body was found at her home, Appleton was discovered in a disused pub in Salford, half a mile from the scene of the murder. He had hanged himself. It wasn't actually that far from, from where the crime had taken place. Suddenly, it all comes to an end because that man has taken his own life. And the justice element of it is just wiped out. You know, there isn't going to be that court case where the father of this person sees the man that did that to his daughter brought to justice. Even now, it still puzzles me, the mentality of George Appleton to take my daughter's life and then take his own. For what? What the hell did any of it achieve? Nothing. Nothing. If he hadn't taken his life, I swear blind, I would have waited and took his. Don't give me prison sentences. I'll give you an eye for an eye. No. I would have done time for George Appleton and done it willingly. The death of George Appleton did not mark the end of the story, however. It posed a series of difficult questions for all those involved. When you read the homicide review, the police was out there a lot of times because she was phoning, because he was turning up and banging on the doors and stuff, and the police took a while to respond. And I know there was allegations when she alleged that he'd sexually assaulted her, that there was no specialist rape suite to interview her in because they were busy. And it's like, find another one somewhere, you know. That poor woman has reported it to the police, but nothing's happening. So why would you phone the police again? It is true to say, and it's been well documented in the past, both in terms of a domestic violence homicide review and indeed, in terms of a commentary from the coroner, Gen Jennifer Leeming, that actually there were a number of failings by a number of different agencies that let Claire down. And clearly, we, we Greater Manchester Police, must take some share of responsibility in terms of um, improving the, you know, the way we respond to domestic abuse. Yeah. This time is there were a number of other homicides at the time that indicated that our response to domestic abuse needed to be improved. We needed to improve the way we responded to vulnerable victims. And I think that was a springboard, really, for a number of uh, key lessons that GMP and other partners learned from her tragic death. Claire deserved an awful lot better than she got. Let me make that quite clear. But I was left in something of a void. There was 24 or 26 months I had to wait for the coroner's inquest because there were so many inquiries going on into Claire's death. And uh, I don't know whether I was appalled or I just hated the situation I was in. But it dawned on me that for every person like me, or every girl that was killed like Claire, it was like, I've likened it to like dropping a pebble into a pond. There was two parents, brothers, sisters, uncles, aunties, grannies, 
family and friends, all with the same sorrow, the same grief and the same mental torture of why didn't I see it coming as myself did. At the coroner's inquest into his daughter's death, Michael would learn not only how his daughter died, but also what was known about George Appleton's history. To hear that this man has, has been done for a kidnap and holding a woman at knife point and harassing several other women and being a Facebook predator as they dubbed him, to hear all that and to know that there was no protection for his daughter, he had questions himself, you know, and he demanded in the inquest, you know, why wasn't my daughter told? That was the missing piece of the jigsaw. Yeah, this man has got a horrific past, and it's not you. He, he's actually targeted you because he's targeting other women at the same time. I was handed a button, which I really couldn't put down. The, the more I held on to it, the bigger it got. It spat something off in the media, the, the papers. I was inundated. I ended up talking in the Palace of Westminster. I ended up talking to women's groups. And before Claire died, geez, I wouldn't have said boo to a goose. But I was encouraged on, not only by women, but by the media who had come and seen and said, you're doing right. What you're asking is common sense. Why doesn't anybody else see it? And I said, well, that's what I'm asking. Why can't anybody else see what I'm... I've only asked a question, why couldn't my daughter have been told George Appleton was a rotten apple? And uh, it just snowballed. Claire's father refused to accept his daughter had died for nothing. He and his supporters were determined to try and save other women at risk of violence at home. Claire Wood was murdered in 2009 by her ex-partner, George Appleton, after she ended their 18-month relationship. Unbeknownst to Claire, Appleton harbored a history of violence towards women. The fact that this information was not available to his daughter still angers her father. She should have been able to find out all about him as far as domestic violence is concerned. I have spoken to Greater Manchester Police. I've talked to women's groups and all said the same thing. Why, why can't they be told? What should have happened was, Claire should have had a risk assessment done. It should have gone to MARAC, the multi-agency risk assessment conference, where all the other agencies are there. So we meet, we have police there, we have drug and alcohol housing, health services, my service, other victim services, and we sit and we discuss the high-risk cases. Some people straight away think, I can't pass on the information because it's been told to me privately in a meeting and oh, obviously that, that's going to mean a lot and she's, she needs to know that this guy has, has battered one woman before or has done this before, but I can't pass that information on. And, and that was the, the sort of, again, the breakdown in communication, you know, um, people thinking, I can't pass on this information. Um, and, and that's why Claire's Law changed all that, really. Following the inquest and a letter from the coroner to the Home Secretary outlining the numerous institutional failings in Claire's case, Michael Brown met a local journalist who'd begun to champion the cause. And then a young lady from Key 103 got in touch and said her name was Michelle Livesey. And would I be so kind as to give her an interview? And I said, well, at that time I, I still wanted people to know that what I'd found out about the amount of people or the amount of girls and men that are killed in this country, I was mad I would have told anybody. And I said, certainly. And that since uh, proved to be a godsend because this young lady took up my cause. Subsequently, Hazel Blair's took up my cause. 
This is Key 103. News. It's 8 o'clock. Key 103's hard-hitting Claire's Law campaign is about to get even more clout. When something like this that happened to Claire happens on my patch, then of course, as the local MP, I feel absolutely driven to try and do what I can to and make sure it doesn't happen to other people. I think when I met Michael, I was inspired by him. Um, and I thought, if, you know, that's a dad, a grieving dad, um, whose family's been torn apart, and yet he's still prepared to try and use that experience um, for, for the general good, then that's the kind of thing that motivates me as a politician. And I, I thought, and Michael and I chatted, um, how do I use my power of my elected office as a member of parliament to try and turn Michael's passion into something practical? Michael's question was a simple one. Why couldn't victims like Claire be provided with information on their partners if they had a history of domestic violence? As he and his supporters considered a way that this disclosure scheme could work, they travelled to London to seek the support of Parliament. When we went down to Westminster, there was myself, Michael, uh, Hazel and Dawn Redshaw from Solver Women's Refuge on, on the sort of panel and questions and were put to them about you know the the, the scheme what we were you know we were proposing um, what happened to Claire and of course with any scheme there are going to be the sort of uh, the positives and negatives that needed to be sort of addressed and, and also debated um, and it was only when sort of the negative started to come out in terms of that uh, sort of um, protection of privacy and is it privacy is your privacy being invaded by this scheme and how do we stop it being invaded that Michael out of nowhere stood up took his shoes off slammed them on the desk and said I challenge any one of you to spend 10 minutes in my shoes I had to get wise quick otherwise I would have sunk like a stone or sat there like some sort of dummy and let these let authority walk over me. And, uh, I mean, it might be small, but I, there's a lot of fight in this little dog. This is the passion that Michael has, you know, and, and the emotion, you know, he, he wasn't saying it to draw attention to himself. It, it was just like an explosion. And to actually take his shoes off and put them on the desk and, and from that moment, he had, he had the room, everybody, and it wasn't, oh, look at this guy, you know, or I feel sorry for this guy. Everyone suddenly realised, yeah, he's right. Following a meeting with the Home Secretary, Theresa May, a pilot scheme was launched involving four police forces, Greater Manchester, Gwent, Nottinghamshire and Wiltshire. Building on an existing idea, men and women would be able to apply to access information about a partner's criminal record to see if they had any previous history of domestic violence. Claire's Law, or as it was officially known, the Domestic Violence Disclosure Scheme was born. When we first started on this journey um, about trying to change uh, the law so that people had a right to find out information about their partners, it was quite controversial. Um, many people said to me, um, you know, will it be people going on a fishing expedition after a first date? They perhaps don't like the look of him, his eyes are too close together, that kind of thing. And, and there were genuine concerns about that. So what we've tried to build is a framework of safeguards so that now people have the, the right to ask um, for details about their partner. If you're concerned, things have started to go wrong, um, and, and not just the person in the relationship, um, but perhaps a, a mum um, or an auntie who's worried about um, you know, somebody in their family, uh, they have a right to ask. The police can then look across the police national database so that they can see information right across the country, and they can see what the incidents are. Disclosure will only take place if, if we've got evidence of, intelligence of, domestic abuse activity. Um, and that we're dealing with someone who has previously perpetrated domestic abuse against either a family member or an intimate partner. So there are some safeguards that it's not about, you know, sharing all sorts of information. In terms of the pilot, we made disclosures in, in less than a third of cases. So some right to ask applications, we had nothing to disclose. There was no history of the individual. The pilot scheme launched around September 2012 and it ran through till September the following year. 
for Greater Manchester, there were 90 applications for disclosures. Out of those, 53 actual disclosures were made. So you can see the difference there in how many applications were actually being made and how many disclosures were being made. The other route that we've articulated in the Domestic Violence Disclosure Scheme is right to know. And that's quite simply um, where an agency, maybe the police, maybe health, children's social care, maybe even a domestic abuse uh, service, is working with a client and they believe that there is information that they're in a new relationship. Maybe it's within the gift and the knowledge of that agency that that new partner is a domestic abuse perpetrator. They've previously seen him at meetings, they've previously seen intelligence and information that would give them cause for concern. They would then approach the police and we'd initiate a right to no application. And then the system kicks in of social services, housing, um, all the protective parts of the system uh, to try and support the woman or the man in making what is a very difficult decision. Very often victims in a domestic abuse relationship are disempowered. They have no power over decision making in terms of where they go, what they do, what they spend their money on, what they're allowed to think. We're now giving them information and it may well be they don't act now, maybe they may act in the future. And it's important that safety net of support services is there to protect them. You don't know if you're getting in with the perpetrator or not, but you would know now under Claire's law because you're going to be told and then you can make choices about it. And then if you decide that you want to leave that person, then well and good, but if you decide you don't want to leave them, then you still should get some support and safety planning. But at least you know what you're dealing with, you know, so you can make informed choices. Another vital tool that was brought in along with Claire's Law was the concept of domestic violence protection orders. The media referred to them as go orders, and in fact that's what they are, they're go orders. If we can't bring a prosecution against a domestic abuse perpetrator for whatever reason, we can issue a domestic violence protection notice by a senior officer, a superintendent, which immediately, and I mean immediately, bans that person from the home. They can remove the perpetrator for up to 28 days, even without the victim's consent. We need to see more of that because that person is given a breathing space and given choice, and the perpetrator is also given some kind of like breathing space to think about their actions. Claire's Law was launched nationally on the 8th of March 2014. The rollout coincided with International Women's Day. What Claire's Law does is give that victim that ability to be able to go and ask and to find out whether their partner is somebody with a history of abuse and to be helped and supported, if that's the case, in making then the right decision. I can't sit here and say it's going to be the panacea to all ills. I can't say it's going to solve the ills of domestic abuse overnight. But I really welcome the work that Michael Brown has done. Um, I'm only sorry that it's taken the tragic death of Claire Wood for us as organisations to take note. I feel somewhat sorry uh, for the position I've put uh, the police in because the police are never going to know who they've saved, but they're going to know who they failed. And th that is somewhat bittersweet uh, but I do believe and I myself and many like me do believe that we are going to make a difference we are not going to do away with domestic violence that was not what we set out to do we set out to give vulnerable people a fight and chance well sadly the figures that we see for the violence against women and girls um, remain quite stubborn. I mean, it's quite difficult to, to change those. Uh, but I think the changes that the government has made, I think the new tools and powers we've introduced uh, are an important part of changing. Uh, but it is about changing culture and attitudes as well. There is still a lot more to do. The government has done a lot, but there is a lot more work to do. And we will continue to focus on this because I want to see an end to violence against women and girls. I want to see an end to domestic violence. It is an abhorrent crime. I don't know about religion, but if there is somewhere, she's looking down and saying, good for you, Dad. But it wasn't just good for me, Dad.
And I say, there's, there's a lot of people gone down my road holding hands with me and saying, this is the way to go. And I would like to think that at least one girl in the UK who had the sense to go to the Bobbies and say, has he escapes what happened to my kid?